So we've now seen the RSA encryption system and we've seen the Algamal encryption system. So for both of those, we have to watch out that our messages are matching um, the format that is required. So for RSA, we need that our message is between 0 and n-1. And for um, the Algamal system, we also need that the message is an element of the group, so typically an integer between 1 and p-1. And then we can encrypt this. But sometimes we are thinking of submitting or encrypting much, much longer messages. Say you want to encrypt a video or you want to encrypt some photos and so on. And those don't fit into the 1000 or 4000 bits that you have available in that space. Now, I already mentioned hybrid encryption system. So those are using a hybrid of public key encryption and symmetric key encryption. And then the public key system is only used to encrypt the key for the symmetric system. So we're this, then just using the symmetric key for authenticated encryption afterwards, and we're using the public key encryption purely to encrypt this key. But even then, we might run into issues with the message space. Say you're having AES with 128 or 256 bits, and you're encrypting it with RSA or Alcamal, and you expect it to have a 4000 bit long message, which is well, of course, solvable by padding, but you have seen in the exercises that padding can be rather fragile. And you not only see this in the exercises, you can also see this in the news about security that yet again, there is some weakness with the padding scheme. And so um, a nicer way of dealing with it is what is called the ChemDem framework. And that's what this lecture is about. So Shub suggested this in 2002 avoid having any knowledge of the message, any of the, for instance, homomorphic properties come in, he uh, wrote a paper saying, hey, how about we just hash the messages before we use them as keys. And then he built this into a bigger framework where CHEM stands for key encapsulation mechanism, and then the DEM is the data encapsulation mechanism, which is just the fancy word for symmetric key cryptography. So the CHEM part, um, looks very much like um, the encryption mechanism, so much so that I even have a typo on the slide here. It should be a public key encapsulation, so chem in the first part. So there are three algorithms. The first one is key generation, just the same as in public key encryption. You have a public key, private key pair. And then instead of encryption, let me also fire up the public key encryption version. Um, I'm highlighting the differences in red here. So for the encryption or the encapsulation part, both times you're taking a public key. And then in the encryption system, you're taking a message and produce a ciphertext. In the encapsulation part, you're only taking a public key. There's no further input. Now the algorithm internally will make some random choices. So it can still sort of encrypt something and there will be still some output. Um, and the output of a public key of a chem is a ciphertext, or chem encapsulation, is a ciphertext and a key. Now this key is the key for the DEM part, so for the symmetric key authenticated encryption. And now the other party also needs to get this key. So the other party then does what is called decapsulation, so the opposite of encapsulation is decapsulation, and that takes the private key and the ciphertext, and then unlike in the public key encryption system, where it produces plain text, here it produces the key. And the key in step three has to be the same as in step two. So the system is sound if the encapsulation and the decapsulation produce the same key when used, well, with the same ciphertext. So if you have a public key encryption system, a PKE, and you want to turn this into a CAN, then the differences are that, again, the color here in red, that one is taking a public key and produces ciphertext and key, whereas the PKE would be taking a public key and a message and then produces a ciphertext. And then the decapsulation has to be the same way that it produces a key. Now, we can run the public key encryption system on a random message. And by random message, I really mean you're taking the entire message space so for RSA, you would have taken any integer 
sampled uniformly random between 0 and n minus 1, or for Elgamal between 0 and p minus 1, you're picking that randomly and then you're encrypting that. Okay, so now we have figured out what we would be using as a message and so we can produce a ciphertext, but then how do we get this key? So what the uh, chem framework is suggesting is that you do the key as a hash of this message. So the hash is then taking this long message, this, well, RSA input or the RML input, and you're hashing it down to the size of the key that you need. So you're taking your 4000 bits, say, and the output of the hash function is the key. So you need to have your hash function such that it takes 4000 bit inputs, but we have seen that our hash functions can be run on arbitrary long inputs, so definitely 4000 bits is not a problem. And we want that the output matches the key size requirements for symmetric key cryptography. So there we want 256 bit or 128 bits. And then for the decryption step, well, turning the decryption step into a decapsulation step, we can just decrypt the ciphertext, then we get the same random message. And then also on the receiver side, we hash that message and get the same key. So if the PKE, the public key encryption system, worked correctly, then also the CAM works correctly. So then also the CAM will have that both the encapsulation and the decapsulation produce the same key so that the other party can also decrypt the data that is sent to it. Okay, so let's do an example. So for RSA as a CAM, there is no change to the key generation. So we're doing exactly what we had on the previous slide. We only need to modify steps two and three, so key gen is still the same. Then the encryption turns into encapsulation, where we're now picking a random message. We're encrypting that, and we're also computing this key. So the encapsulation has two outputs, the ciphertext, which in this case is m to the e mod n, and the key, which is the hash of the message. Now, of course, anybody who can get the message can compute this key. And so the decapsulation is using the decryption function, namely that the ciphertext to the D gives the same message. And then from this message, we compute the hash and we get a key. And the system is sound, so it works correctly because RSA gives us that M prime is equal to M. And so the hash of those messages, K prime is equal to K. Now the other system, Algomal, we could also modify like this, but we actually did Algomal as a way to turn this Diffie-Hellman key exchange into an encryption system. So let's go back to Diffie-Hellman itself. So Diffie-Hellman says, well, everybody knows a certain group and a generator for this group and how to compute in this group. So the groups we've been looking at, the good group was the mod primitive group of the integers modular prime and the weak group was the additive group of the integers modular prime. So the key generation is simply just the same as the Diffie-Hellman. You're picking a number which is less than the group order. You're computing g to the power a in that group. So typically this means g to the a mod p. And then the public key is the result of this exponentiation and the private key is the experiment. For the encapsulation, we're basically doing what I had described in the previous slide set, a semi-static Diffie-Hellman. So we're picking a random integer r, we're computing the Diffie-Hellman share for this r, so we're computing g to the r, and then while well, we compute our shared key. Now, since I don't know Alice's secret key, the way that I get the shared key is taking Alice's public key to this power r, and you can already look ahead in the decapsulation, Alice will compute the same value, as taking the h that I just computed with the r and that to the power a. And then in the chem, I'm always hashing this, but I had also recommended this already as part of the Diffie-Hellman. You should always hash things so that you're removing any biases, that you're removing any algebraic structure. Okay, so the encapsulation produces this h, which we now call the ciphertext. So that is the way that Alice can find out something about r. And it also produces the key k. Now, this key, uh, <laughs> you're only sending the h part, you're only sending the ciphertext. You're keeping the key for yourself and you're using that to do the symmetric key encryption authentication. 
And then on the receiving end, when Alice is there, she uses her private key, the lowercase a, computes h to the a, and she computes the hash of it. Now, this gives the same k because of the Dewey-Hellman manipulation. So both of them have computed g to the a r in just two different ways. So Diffie-Hellman is very naturally seen as a chem. Well, we're kind of splitting things up. We're making Alice have a public key, private key pair, and Bob or whoever encrypts to her doing a one-time key. So it is really the semi-static Diffie-Hellman that we're having here, but then it's just the chem framework. Well, I mean, just the same that you would normally do explained in the chem framework. So that means that this chem framework is very useful in order to um, model things and to get keys out of it. And then the dem part is what we covered in the first part of this course, where we do pick a block cipher or a stream cipher, and then we're using a Mac in addition to that to have authenticated encryption.